Well, hello there, and welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum, and I am here today to talk about, I would say, some fairly obscure cargo airplanes that uh, are one of our allies built, and so it's kind of a, a fun thing to do. Now, one of the things that we do here is we recycle airplanes and this is going to be an example of something that we have used and I'm going to tell you about uh, how we used it and what we do with it to get kids excited about aviation. But first, I am with my tenebrific assistant, Greg Kenny. I got it, that's pretty good, who has thrown me into another uh, fascinating headgear today. This one is a little bit difficult. I have to see if I get this one off. There we go. Oh, it came off pretty good there. There we go, Greg. Thank you so much. So I am standing next to, and the Vikings, I like the hat, Greg, because the hat is kind of a portent of what we're going to be talking about today. This is a nomad, and the Vikings were kind of nomads, weren't they? Seafaring, they went all over the globe. So in a way, Greg has once again put me in a ridiculously coiffed headgear, but uh, kind of tied it back to the airplane. I always like how he does now. Now this is a GAF Nomad, a Nomad from the Government Aircraft Factories in Melbourne, Australia. So good day to the Australians and their foray into aircraft construction. Uh, this is a passenger cargo aircraft that was built for the Australian Army. It also flew for the Indonesian military. Its first flight was in 1971. Now this is a C-123 provider, but I'm going to use this because I don't think the good old Nomad ever had a model done on it, but Greg can throw up a plan view if we can find one on the, on the Nomad, but essentially a twin engine, high wing aircraft, retractable landing gear. Its size, uh, retractable gear on this was uh, was unusual at the time. It had kind of a lattice work fuselage construction. We're going to talk about that in a second. Um, but it um, it flew for the Royal Flying Doctor Service, the Australian Army, and the Australian Customs Service, as well as the Indonesians. And believe it or not, Greg, some of these actually made it into puddle jumper airlines in the United States which is how this one actually made it into our inventory, it was over in Tucson. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, the uh, first flight was in 1971. There were only 172 of these produced. Greg, if you can believe that, 172, that's kind of a, a low number. They ended production in 1985. Um, the uh, type certificate was acquired by GIP Aero, in 2008, they planned on building it as the GA-18. It is now been acquired, GIP has been acquired by the Indian company Manhindria. Manhindria, if I didn't do that good, that's an Indian company uh, sometimes. The, uh, the counterpart to this aircraft is probably uh, the de Havilland Beaver for you, uh, your Beaver fans out there. And it is a successor to an aircraft that operated in Australia called the DHA-3, the Drover. Greg can go out and see if you can find an image of a Drover. Uh, now, this airplane is interesting in that very lightweight construction, two-place, twin engines, uh, designed to get out on a short takeoff and landing.
what the Australians were trying to do with this airplane at the time was come up with uh, some industrial aviation base that was native to Australia, which is why it was built by these aircraft facilities. They were actually funded to build the airplane. Now, there was a problem, Greg, and what was the problem? The problem was tailplane fatigue. Now, if you look up this type, the challenge with the type was that, remember, when you're going into short field and uh, short takeoff and landing, what do you get, Greg? You get a lot of short stops with a lot of oomph. We've used that term before, but a lot of force. And the takeoffs as well can be relatively high G because what's end up happening, you're going to full power and you're lifting off in a very short field. And the maneuvers to get out of the field can be somewhat high G. And you can imagine flying these airplanes in the outback and, and getting off unimproved strips. Um, the airplane went through uh, you know, quite a bit of robust use. Now, what ended up happening with the airplane was the tailplane started to show fatigue and were falling off. That is a bad thing when the tail for the airplane falls off. And the aircraft started to show really serious production problems. Um, in So much so that in 1976, uh, the chief test pilot for the airplane, Stuart Pierce, and the chief designer, David Hopper, were both killed in a crash of this airplane. And uh, that put a stigma on the plane. Uh, as of May 2007, and Greg, I don't know that we've seen uh, numbers like this before. I'm going to give you this number, and it, it's actually a little bit amazing to me. In uh, May of 2007, there were 32 of these involved in total loss accidents. So a total loss accident is the entire airframe is destroyed. And that generally means a crash. I mean, literally the airplane, it doesn't make it back. It falls out of the sky. There were 76 fatalities involved in this airplane with those crashes. So for any airplane in that kind of a low production number to have that many crashes, which are complete loss of the airframe, and that many fatalities is, is pretty high. But what were they trying to do? Were they trying to move men and cargo uh, folks around uh, in, in a very, very rough terrain? Now, the C-123 provider was a very successful, but remember it had that, that drop cargo ramp and, and uh, the characteristics of a lot of these, uh, these uh, short-run uh, uh, cargo haulers. This was the Australians' effort to get into this and to do that. It was not what I would say successful. In fact, it's very interesting that Menindra really even acquired the type. But what they found out was in the subsequent use of these airplanes that uh, the calculations that were used, the airframe stress calculations that were used, were just not right. They were wrong. And so consequently, when they put the airplane into uh, production, what they were learning is they were learning the hard way uh, design problems in production. Now, Greg, I'll give you a famous movie, a Fred Fun Fact, has nothing to do with this airplane, but a production design loss in the movies that is comparable to this. And that would be, did you ever see the movie The Blue Max, where George Prepard at the end of the movie, they tell him to go up and fly the airplane, and they know that the wing is going to come off the airplane, because the guy, the one test pilot's already come back and said, the, the wing is unstable, it's going to come off. And guess what happens? They go out and fly the airplane, and the wing comes off the airplane. That is, it's less common today with computer-assisted design on airframes, but uh, because they can simulate stress and they can see things. But back in the day of slide rules and where airplanes were being designed uh, from paper blueprints and calculations, it's not uncommon whether it's an American aircraft or an aircraft that's designed by another manufacturer overseas to have in these early airplanes especially, uh, and even up into the 70s, where you run into a design problem and uh, they just didn't catch it. And it's generally fatigue, which is what really went after this airplane. 
Now, I'm going to put this down, and I'm going to salute the type. There were, there were only 172 of these made, but I'm going to salute all you short takeoff and landing cargo haulers, like C-123s and everybody else. That's a tough job. If you're a short-term cargo hauler, especially if you're in, uh, let's say, hauling cargo in Vietnam during the Vietnam War to all those fire bases, those short fire bases, there were Congressional Medal of Honor recipients that were uh, that received that award from the short takeoff and landing aircraft because the job was just so tough. It doesn't matter whether anybody is shooting at you or whatever. If you're flying in the outback in Alaska or you're flying in combat, probably some of the most dangerous flying that you can do is short takeoff and landing flying, especially with cargo. So Greg today has given me Orangia, Orangia? I, I think so. Shake the pulp. Okay, it's sparkling a citrus beverage, light, lightly shake to mix. Well, we already did that. Hundred calories. A cute little bottle. Uh, I don't see. Can I say cute little bottle? Uh, that's well. I guess that's okay. They, they would like since 1936. They hopefully would like that I called it a cute little bottle. It is caffeine free. We're going to go ahead and give it a shot. You know, Greg, that's a win. Win. A win for Fred. This is one I actually, I'll take another sip. Hmm. Greg, this is not bad. One you actually didn't poison me with today. I'm going to hold on to this one. So, so. Uh, short takeoff and landing flying can be some of the rugged, most dangerous flying you're doing, especially with cargo. So what happened to these airplanes? Well, as I said, by the late 2000, uh, 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 2007, 2008, um, they were pretty much pulled from service. Um, as of 2009, another interesting statistic, there's only one flying in Australia and four in New Zealand, uh, anywhere of the type. So the type had completely gone out of service. Now, where did we get this one? Well, this one came out of Tucson and was one of those regional airline aircraft. It had flown in a regional airline out of Louisiana, I believe, and had done a lot of short-haul short, uh, short haul stuff. We probably, and I don't know this to be, because this aircraft, we have retooled it to get kids excited about flying. Greg, do you remember when I was a kid, you could go to the park, and the fighter jet would be there, and you could get in the fighter jet, and you'd be trying to fly it, and those are all gone now because they're deemed too dangerous. But kids, there's something about airplanes like this and kids being able to get in and move the stick and, and the throttles and pretend they're flying that just is so exciting for them, and that is what this has been repurposed into. Now, it came out of Tucson. It came out of one of the boneyards. Uh, but I would venture to say, Greg, Greg, that in the time that this aircraft has been in service, kind of getting kids excited, it has probably flown more people than the fleet flew in the entire, the fleet flew, that's kind of, I got that one pretty good, uh, than the entire time that they were in service. There have been thousands of kids through this aircraft, and we really think it is a wonderful addition. We continue to use it, and, and the kids love it. Now... Mm. Greg, home run. That makes me happy. Uh, having something to drink here today. If you were one of the short takeoff and landing folks in this, you could be called an air pirate. It's like how I worked that one in. So this, by the way, is one of the very first shirts that we ever produced. This is our product placement. This is the air pirate. This is an image that Stan Stokes did for us. It's almost 10 years old, but you can go out to the website and, and pick this up. Personally, of all of the images that we've done, I like this one the best. I think this is a very cool image. We use it for a lot of stuff. We actually, when we go to air shows, we have a flag that we put up that is the air pirate flag that we've arrived. But uh, you can go out to the website and pick this up. It's, it's very, very cool. Jason will be happy to ship it to you. And uh, we'll get you one. You can become your very own air pirate. R. although that was a, a Viking there. So 
I didn't get close, Greg, but we'll see what happens. Now, we're working through a number of our aircraft that are in various segments of the museum, and I promise you, next week, you're not going to want to miss that episode because we're going to be talking about an airplane that hasn't seen the light of day in probably about 20, 25 years, which is kind of exciting. We're going to talk about a one-off airplane. It's a one-of-one, one, and it hasn't been seen in many, many years, and I know you're going to enjoy that. But in the meantime, if you like this episode, I hope today we earned your subscription. Subscribe to our channel. Like us on Facebook. Like us on YouTube. Remember, we cannot do this work without your generous donation. So hit that donation link and shoot us a donation. My name is Fred Bell. I'm the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great day.